speakers, practitioners to share with you today tips, tools, their story, uh, poetry, to inspire, encourage, and empower you, parents and youth and everyone in between uh, with our message of hope. And hope stands for the acronym, Hold On Possibilities Emerging. So all of us here, we have been through struggles. We have been through dark times and trials and we have overcome and we are, and we have learned and we have been blessed and we want to share uh, some of the ways that we've been able to do that with you, to inspire you. So today is just uh, the sample of what's coming. Uh, each person's gonna be speaking for five minutes. They're gonna be telling you a little bit of, about what they're gonna be speaking on in October 7th. We'll be doing the same thing. They'll be speaking longer. We'll have more speakers also to join in. I just wanna share this message out, share it with those who need it. And um, so October 7th, and that, that will be uh, Zoom and uh, Facebook Live. And I want to introduce um, my wonderful partner, Linus, who is the founder of the Hope and Wellness events. Hey, everybody. My name is Linus Woods Mullins, and I am a holistic living and wellness expert for women over 40. And I happen to also be the creator and founder of the Hope and Wellness brand. And actually, the acronym for uh, the HOPE piece actually is honoring our purpose every day. And the reason why I decided on that for an acronym for HOPE is because I felt back in February when I decided to start doing these events that people just needed some hope and they needed to remember what their actual purpose was and to honor that every day, as well as also maintain their wellness. So the very first event that we did was in May, and that was a summit where we had 14 speakers talking about wellness overall. And then just three weeks ago, we did another event, uh, which was a retreat for two days. We had a total of 21 women who participated, and we did kind of a spa-like theme and talked about different things that we can do from a holistic perspective to be well in our minds, bodies, and spirits. This time around, uh, Carolyn is the one who's spearheading this effort to uh, bring an awareness of the importance of families to have hope and to be well and to really be looking out for those signs when there's any family member that may be falling into a level of emotional unwellness. The speakers that uh, Carolyn has gathered for you today are all people who have had some kind of experience maybe uh, with raising children or perhaps uh, families, uh, perhaps some experience with suicidal ideation or suicide prevention, has worked with youth in particular. And we even have a youth person with us, which I'm so excited to see, uh, who's going to be sharing with us her perspective in terms of what it takes to be well. So sit back and relax. We're gonna be with you for the next hour or so. Uh, I really am looking forward to hearing all the wonderful messages. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for uh, putting this together. And thank you to all of the speakers in advance for all the wonderful messages you will be delivering. So if you will just bear with me, I'm getting ready to start the show, so to speak. So hang on.
reckon that And plays inside my head I try to turn it down But I can't quite shine it out I'm tortured every day These never ending worries Pulling on my sleeves So many times now I was supposed to tap out All the walls would fall down around me All anybody would tell me Is all that bad news How it's gonna fall through But no matter what they say Or what they say It's gonna be gonna be It's going to be okay. Breathe into gratitude. Something wonderful is going to happen today, maybe through this event. And I love that song that we just had. In fact, that's one of our speakers, Marlise Hyde. That's her niece. And uh, they, they did that for a high school project. And right now, the young man in there is on, in the MTC right now, getting ready to go on a mission. And so they gave us permission to use that. I thought it was perfect. Thank you, Marlies. Thank you to your, your niece. So I'd like to introduce now Sarah Clements, who's going to be singing for us. And come on, come on down, Sarah. <laughs> so I'm going to be singing Lord of the Dance. And... This hymn was written by the English songwriter Sidney Carter in 1963. And some of you might be familiar with the, the tune. It's from an American Shaker song called Simple Gift. And this hymn is widely performed in English speaking congregations. Um, my family adapted the words. You'll see that if you're familiar with this song, you'll see that my family kind of adapted the words a little bit. And I want to start this off with like a visualization exercise. So I'm going to be inviting you to close your eyes as you hear me sing. I want you to um, hear the story and feel the story of this song that is told by this song and to increase the, the feeling of um, intimacy during the song you'll see that I switch from a perspective of talking about the dancer in this song to the perspective of the dancer of the song. So I want everyone to take a breath with me and then close your eyes and listen to the song. So here we go. Mm. 
He danced in the morning when the world was begun. He danced in the moon, in the stars and in the sun. He came down from heaven and he danced on the earth. At Bethlehem he had his birth. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be and i'll lead you all in the dance said he i danced for the scribe and for the pharisee but they would not dance and they would not follow me i danced for the fishermen for james and for john they came with me and the dance went on Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and they left me there on the cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be and I'll lead you all in the dance said he i danced on a friday when the sky turned black it's hard to dance with the devil on your back they buried my body and they thought i'd gone but i am the dance and i still go on dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your talents. And that was beautiful to set us off. Thank you so much. So I'm going to call Sherilyn to jump on. Sherilyn, are you ready? I am. All right. It was her great suggestion um, that people could really appreciate uh, prayer at this time in the world. And so she's going to lead us off with a prayer. Our dear gracious God, we give thee thanks for thy abundance of love and mercies. We give thanks for Jesus Christ, for the everlasting healer of our souls. We love thee. We love you so much for all that you have done for us, for all that you are, for all of us, for all that you teach us about ourselves and who we are and who our children are. We ask that we might see with your eyes, that we might see with your ears, and that our hearts might be open, that we will receive the message that is meant for us today. We ask for a blessing upon our amazing, talented, and humble speakers and presenters, that, that our hearts will be opened, that we will deliver the message that thou has placed within us. We ask for a blessing upon families, the husbands, the wives, the children, 
the many who are burdened beyond their own ability at this, this time, who do not see a way out. We ask that their hope might be brightened, that, that that spark of hope within them will grow, that each of them will find the tool or quote or inspiration or reminder that they need today. We love you. We are so grateful that you are here for us. We are mindful that among us today in, in the audience are people with many beliefs and we acknowledge the beliefs and gifts and goodness of all people, knowing that we are all children of the Most High. We pray that all will feel that they belong, that we are here as brothers and sisters, as one united family, a family with incredible gifts and diversity, that that you do not want us to be exactly like each other, that each of us has something to bring to the table, to offer. And we pray with, that around the world, this, this element of love, this element of receiving and of giving, that it may go forth, that darkness may be cast out, that light will enter, that truth and goodness will prevail. We give thanks for the abundance that is deep within us in a reservoir that is yet untapped. And we pray that this power may be unleashed among us, that it may go forward, that each of us might share that light, that reservoir of goodness with someone else, that this ripple effect may go throughout the world. We give thanks for Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the amazing, amazing people who have lived throughout the world, who inspire us, who have been leaders, who have been humble servants, who have been inspirers of hope. We pray that their legacies may live on. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I felt the power in that. That was just what the world needed. Thank you, Sherilyn. Thank you. All right. So we're going to begin with our celebration of life and empowering and inspiring and sharing tools and tips on in improving emotional and mental well-being for for everyone and i'd like to start with a panel and those who are, are ready to to jump in i'm going to ask a, a question a couple questions today and so unmute yourself and then share share your thoughts and the first question is words of wisdom and advice for the parents out there, the parents that are, are struggling and they, they, maybe their children are struggling or they're struggling. And I just wanted to start it off with Sherilyn, come back on, you give that prayer. Why don't you start, start off with your thoughts? Cause you're going to be addressing parents today. And so would you share? Yes. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you, Linus. Thank you to everyone who is here and who will listen. So the, the message that I feel to share with parents at, at this time is when you have a struggling child, and I know what it's like to have a struggling child. Sorry, I've been emotional since earlier on with these beautiful things happening behind the scenes. So forgive me if, for my tears and my voice, but when you have a loved one that is struggling, to remember that you have power within you and that you are always an influencer, that you always have the ability to to send love, to see the highest good in your child, to see who they truly are. Now, sometimes as parents, we want, we want something really tangible and practical. And, and often what we think, speaking of children, I have one that just popped in. Can you sit out for a sec, hon? Ask, ask Wobble, okay? All right. Sorry. Um, I am a mother of six children, and I have had um, a number of children that have had some huge challenges and that have turned into gifts for them in their lives. But often as parents, we, when our child is struggling and they might say something that's a really dark thought that they're experiencing. And we have a tendency to be like, oh, you can't say that. Or maybe there's a bit of shame or guilt, you know, that they cannot voice those feelings. And I'd like to offer a little bit of a different piece. And instead, 
empower our children to express their feelings and that there are no bad feelings. And instead, listen and just say to them, I'm here for you and let them talk and just open and create a space. Now, I, I talk probably a little bit too much. I can do that. But that's my piece. I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here for you. I'd like to add to Sherilyn's piece. I'm a mother of three. Um, and one of my children are, it struggles extremely. And I found, since now my children are older, that the best piece I could do is to love them. Love them who they are and provide that hope. When my daughter has gone through areas of depression, I remind her that it's all right to feel depressed. It's all right to feel these things, but know that it's just your body signaling a need for a change. That's all. There doesn't have to be a knee jerk reaction to it, but then help them gain that ability to make that change. I'd also like to add something. So um, I struggled with suicidal thoughts when I was in high school. And um, the biggest thing that my parents did for me was to um, work with me through recovery because um, a lot of the times if there's, you know, an issue with the kid, um, that issue can also be deeper in the family and um, parents are absolutely wonderful and I'm so grateful for my parents, but they're not perfect. So um, parents remember that you're human, um, be open to making changes that you need to make in your life to create that open environment where your children can come and talk to you about what they're feeling and um, hold space for them. Um, and like Sherilyn said, don't shut down their feelings. If they come to you with dark things, listen to them. Um, and then also let them um, have some say in how they go about and how you go about seeking help. Um, you know, forcing children to go to a counselor or be on medication is not productive. But um, when I was able to say like, this is what I want to do. I want to, to do this. And I'll go into a little bit more of my story in my um, talk, but I was able to say like, this is what I want to do. And my parents supported me in that. And it, um, it was life changing. Carolyn, if I can offer a couple of words and thoughts. Uh, the phrase keeps going through my mind that I've learned through the years. If you don't like your kid, they won't like you either. <laughs> and a lot of times depressing um, modes that they go through creates repelling behaviors. And that is when you love them. You think, treat, embrace. When you're speaking about them, you speak in respect and love and their behaviors when they grow and become adults they may not even remember a lot of the behaviors that they had that were negative but they will remember you embrace them you spoke to them in respect you love them you saw the best in them love your kid like your kid and that is a healing uh, skill Um, I would like to say as um, a teen myself, um, it can be really hard sometimes with the word of wisdom and following my beliefs. And I know that sometimes trying to push it on me just makes me not want to follow it. But instead, when my parents influence me and sit down and talk to me about the importance of it and um they love me and they care for me and they let me make my own decisions of course within the region of their um discipline but just that influence and that love 
that they show makes me want to do it. But when I feel like they're like pushing me or like, you have to do this, you have to do this, then it just makes me feel like I'm not as respected. Like my opinions aren't as respected, but I love when they just sit me down and talk about how important those beliefs are and how it doesn't just affect um, me, it affects everyone. And that really helps. Lizzie, while you're there, would you also talk to the other teens, the other kids out there, your advice on, um, you know, when, when they're really struggling with their parents or in their life? Struggling with parents can be really hard. And you know, I've dealt with it just like every other teen has. Um, I just suggest let yourself cool down. Let yourself look back at the situation. Don't just look at yourself because I know a lot of times I'm like, no, I'm right. I know better than them because I think I do. And this is, I'm right. But once I start stepping back and let myself cool off, I say chillax a lot. I'm like, chillax. <laughs> but um, once you just start cooling off and step back and look at the situation, I just suggest looking back and talking to your parents in a more calm manner where everyone is respected, even you and your parents as well, because they probably do know better than you. <laughs> Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you. That was awesome. Great perspective. All right, we're going to move on to the uh, addressing um, kids, youth that are struggling right now, that are full of anxiety, worry, depression. What are what are the thoughts on that advice for others? I'd like to share something. So for those who are struggling with those emotions like depression and anger and anxiety, those can really spiral down if we push the emotions down and we don't deal with them. What happens when we just ignore what we're feeling as the emotions stack up, then we can't deal with it and we explode. I've dealt with that a lot myself. And as I've looked inward into what's really going on with me, and I've been able to journal it out, I've been able to get my thoughts more clear-headed and then communicate more clearly. And so acknowledge what you're feeling, validate it, but don't just stuff it down. Love yourself in it. And I do that by saying, even though I feel this emotion, I still love myself. I really like that. I was going to piggyback off of that because that was actually going to be one of the things I said is um, we oftentimes adults will say, communicate your ideas, communicate your thoughts. And as young people, it's hard sometimes to structure our feelings or to structure our thoughts. And writing is really, really powerful because it allows us to feel heard without speaking. Um, and when we are feeling heard, we become more communicative. And so I often tell the, youth and the children that I work with, you're going to do a much better of our job of verbally articulating your feeling after you've written them down first. So take a moment, write yourself a letter, write your parents a letter, whomever you want to communicate to, write them a letter, then read over it, and then go talk. And you'll have a better grasp on your thoughts so you can communicate them more um, effectively and you'll get a better result with those who are listening as well. I'd like to chime in a second too. Um, I don't know, if, <laughs> where am I? Um, a couple of things, so for parents and for teens, Please don't discount the power of actual touch. They've done studies in Romanian orphanages 
the children who are held, their brains actually develop and grow better than those who are not. So teenagers, you know, they want to tell you, you don't want to touch your parents, whatever. The power of hugs is absolutely important. And it's not this 10 second hug. It has to be a good 30 second hug. So grab your kid and hold them. And that's a really good thing. I'd like to add something. For me, it's the breath. It's going back to breathing as emotions and feelings come up, learning to breathe through them. Feelings are meant to pass. They're not meant to stay. If we shove them down and don't deal with them, they do stay. But if we breathe through them, they will go away. And that is one way that has helped me. Um, just to add to all what has been said in fact just go back just a little bit when we talk about the parents one important thing to understand is uh, the respect that we must have for individualism each person is an individual and a lot of times we and and sometimes we are right about what we're gonna say but the fact is even though i'm right that does that does not mean that the other person must accept it. And what the other person is feeling or belief is just as important as what I know. And is very before, before one can receive you, you must receive them as an individual. So that is very important to, 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 to point that out, that I see you as an individual. Now, it's a, it's a privilege, it's an honor for me to be speaking to you and, and, and you giving me the time of day, so to speak, listening to what I'm saying, that is your choice. And you don't have to do that. So, 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 so just understanding that is, is one important thing. Um, coming back to talking to youth about feelings, it is important to legitimize the feeling. Whatever you're feeling is real, that's reality. And your reality is never wrong. You know, you are not wrong to feel the way you feel. It might not be something that's going to lead, lead into a productive life. It might be something that you need to get out or flush out. But you first got to acknowledge that this is what, where I'm at right now. And I'm not wrong for feeling the way that I'm feeling. And this will help you to, 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 to once you own the feeling, you, you, you can see, reach out to resources that can give you help. But it's important to make that a reality and that reality is not wrong. I'd like to piggyback off of that and combining that with um, when it comes to physical touch with our children. I love what you said because like due to the trauma that some of my children have been through, they are not quite yet open to being hugged. And so I talked to them as an individual, what would you like? How can we, how can we start this um, process and this journey of connecting emotionally and physically and verbally? And I even have a child that right now, um, in order to show this child that I appreciate um, the child's contributions to my home um, and, and just show some affection, like even, and it may be, kind of funny, but this shows the individuality here, is we've decided that when I'm going to show her affection that's physical, I will just poke her, <laughs> that's all. But she feels that love, she knows my mom is developing this emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical connection with me the best way for me. And she's able to express that um, and try Trust that I'll do that. To add to what you just said, um, taking it one step further, the power of a hug, you can literally share your vibration and your light and your power with your child by that touch and that transference. And so even if it's just a poke, it should be a good 20 or 30 seconds and explain to your children that, okay, I understand you're sad now. I'm going to give you some of my happiness by this hug or by this touch. All right, I'll, I'll chime in here too. I, I love this powerhouse of uh, information and ideas. Uh, it's so valuable. 
And I know that uh, I've studied the emotions uh, and, and help people release emotions. Um, <clears throat> and it starts with a thought. It starts with that thought that then becomes that feeling. And when you express that feeling, it becomes that emotion. And it, it's about expressing our emotions in healthy ways and finding those ways. And we've talked about writing is one way and talking to someone is one way and getting a hug is another way. Um, one of the, the best things I uh, did, I had a friend I, uh, give me a book that uh, changed everything with the relationship with my, one of my daughters. And uh, she was rebellious and she didn't want to follow the rules and she uh, wanted to push, ag push against everything that, that I believed in. And um, I found myself doing the lectures. I'm lecturing her on why she should. And, and then I read this book and this was about, uh, the most important line in the whole book was, take your worries to the Lord and take your love to your family. That changed everything. And I just extended more and more love. And in my prayers, I let out my, my anger and my frustration. And then I got it out. And then I was able to give her unconditional love and accept her choices and where she was going. And that she was trying to insert her dependence and find her way in the world. And that's what our, our teens are trying to do. And we have to give them that space to be able to do that, even though it's, we, we worry and we don't want them to make poor decisions. It, it's that individualism and they've got to find their way. Can I jump in for a sec? So I think it's so powerful that, you know, what, what Stephen shared about honoring our children and asking permission, he, he didn't say asking permission, but we are going to make mistakes. Our kids are going to make mistakes. And to, it is so honoring to allow our children to make mistakes. That's the greatest honoring of our ability to choose. Because if we are, we are controlling everything they do, first of all, they feel disempowered. They feel, you know, what else would lead a child? Like that very thing is going to lead down a pathway of, of hopelessness if they don't feel like they can choose and they don't have any options in their life. And so to honor when they are making a different choice than we would make, even if it, you know, obviously we don't want them, you know, to harm themselves and there are places we need to step in for sure. But there's so many mistakes that are, that are innocent, that are without, you know, a lot of damage. And, and if we allow them to make little mistakes and a number of big mistakes while they're home, that empowers them for when they grow up and they're on their own. And I had the opportunity years ago to live in Russia. I worked there as well as I served a mission trip, mission trip there. And, and while I was there, there was a, a woman who her whole life, her mom had made every decision for her. And she got out there and here she, she had a desire to help people, but she, she didn't know how. And she, you know, we had to teach her. She could actually choose things for herself. And she's become an amazing architect and become, you know, just done amazing things in the world. But sometimes we're afraid of letting our children fail. And we're afraid of letting them get bad grades. We're afraid of what, is, what we're going to look like if our children make mistakes. And I just want to remind us, all of us, that if we're human. Love each other in the mistakes. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go on to our next question and just uh, we'll just give brief answers on this one so we can get to move on to the good stuff with everyone speaking. And that question is, what do you do to keep yourself positive and happy? What tool do you use? What action do you do? Um, I'll start off. Um, one of the things that I use is positive self-talk. Um, I've taught school for 41 years and and you have good days and you have bad days, but I know if I go into the classroom or into my home or into with where my family is and I am thinking positively, I am a good mother, I am a good teacher, I am a good whatever, I have that and I, I say those things, it makes a difference in my life and in the world. I'm gonna chime in here. There was a little, uh, I don't know, poem that my mom taught me when I was young. Um, and I say it to myself when I look in the mirror getting ready every morning. I am a daughter of royal birth. My father is king of heaven and earth. My spirit was born in the courts on high. 
a daughter beloved, a princess and I, and I am a Disney nut and I've always loved princesses. So I've always been the secret princess in my heart. And so when other people around were mean or bullying or whatever, it's like water off a duck's back. I know who I am. It doesn't matter what you think. I love that about, I had to move to a place that's kind of echoey, so I'm really sorry about that. But I love having a proclamation and two amazing ones were just shared, but stating who you are each and every morning to remind yourself of that can help keep you out of the depths of the darkness. And I do that too, and that's something that makes a big difference. One of the things that I do to stay happy and to stay in a space of um, joy is, um, and this is probably what my husband will say too, because he has taught me to do this, is to stay in a place of gratitude. And so in addition to um, um, continually writing down affirmations, I also wake up every day and list out the things that are really going well for me, right? Because I understand and I recognize that whatever I focus on is what is going to be reality for me. And there are bad things happening. There's a lot of crazy, not so fun things happening in the world right now. And we could all list them. But we could also identify the wonderful things that are happening. And if I go through those every day or whenever I feel myself getting anxious or short of breath or scared or angry, I also take a moment to look around me and go, well, cool, I have, I have a car. You know, um, really cool. Like I have really cool kids. Um, a, I have paper to write with, mm -hmm. and like listing those things out. Even I try to get the really, really simple, silly ones and point them out. Like my toes have half of the fingernail polish on them. You know, like <laughs> I have pink hair today. Um, things like that. Um, they make me giggle inside my spirit, and that just helps me to stay happy. Just to add to that, since um, our mic is already on, is just the idea that this is not the only thing that is happening right now. Uh, it is very easy to hone in on something like I'm driving down the street and I get a flat tire. And I can, I can live there if I want to or if I choose to, but it's very important to get to the point where you can say, Oh, I have a flat, flat tire, but this is not the only thing that's happening right now. You know, there are a whole lot of other things that are happening in this very moment, and all of them are probably a whole lot better than having a flat tire. So, 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 so we we get to pick and choose where we want we we want to focus our full attention, and there are so many things that happen in, in happen in our lives that are not bad that we can, fo we, we can focus on. And I absolutely love the idea of just stating who you are because we are not the things that are happening. The things that are happening, they are happening to us, but they are not us. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that. Amen. I, I love that because that reminds me of, well, I'll talk to my children about something that will happen that will really disappoint them. And, and I'll affirm them and I'll empathize with them. And at the end, we wrap it up with, but you know what? My worth is based off of who I am, not what I do, not what's going on around me, based off of who I am. And they connect to, I mean, as a chaplain, I'll say they connect to their higher power. You know, they connect to, to a source where they know who they really are. And reminding yourself of that is so key. So for me, it's definitely doing things that I enjoy. Um, I absolutely love theater and music and performing. And that, doing that, being involved with things like that, is what saved my life in high school. And I still try <laughs> to do that today to bring joy into my life. And some days it looks like throwing on music while I'm in the shower or doing yoga or um, just like dancing around in my house to bring that, that joy and that purpose back into my life. 
Um, because I know for me, and I think a lot of people like being able to connect physically um, and doing things that are fun and enjoyable makes you feel better. It like boosts your self-esteem and boosts those, that serotonin and those endorphins in your body and um, gets you reconnected and regrounded with, with who you are and with that feeling of joy. Just a couple of thoughts too. I think when we deal with really difficult, deep um, crisis events with our children, um, we need some really deep relief with our Savior Jesus Christ, who knows us perfectly, who is in every detail of our children's lives. And a way for me to receive happiness is focus my day around Christ. Um, reach out through service, volunteer opportunities, do something every single day that invites that light of Christ into your life and share it with others. Beautiful. We have time for one more. Did anyone really had something else they needed to say? Pop yes, I, I, I will. I kind of want to piggyback on um, what the last young lady said um, about um, <clears throat> focusing on Christ, being uh, centered in Christ, because uh, typically our actions and our behaviors are based on how we feel about ourselves, right? So if I understand, if I have revelation of who God is, in my life, then I understand who I am, right? And then if I understand who I am, then I can understand whose I am. So I'm then able to understand all the benefits that I can reap from that, right? Happiness is fleeting. So, but the joy that I'll have is when I'm anchored in Christ, that hope of, you know, that, that I'll have optimistic or positive expectation is not dependent on uh, my circumstances then. So um, my identity in Christ, when I deal with the youth that I talk to and mentor a lot, um, is really kind of focusing on who you are and in Christ, because that's not going to change. He's immovable, and that won't change. All right, Damar, stay right there, because you're up next. Oh, okay. I'm going to introduce you. Um, Damar is one of my friends, and I met him uh, when he was uh, performing some spoken word. And I have never experienced uh, quite the emotion that came and touched my heart through his words, um, his gift and his talent and his light. And I just remember my heart opening and I'm like, I need to know this guy. I need to know him. Uh, he has a beautiful gift and I am so honored that he said yes to be part of, part of this summit. And he's a youth pastor and a spoken word artist and i am so happy that i get to share him with all of you and so damar go ahead all right um i'm so in love with love that my soul is in love with love because love is i am and i am is he and before i was formed in my mother's womb i am was in love with me Love is everything that I'm not getting the stillness of motion in this pandemic. Love is everything that I am, down to the particles in the air that dance in these arteries under these articles, giving life to once arthritic wallflowers at the ends of these here limbs. Love has given a purpose to my fingers that are far more for pointing out what's wrong with her or with he. These, my friends, are for hanging on to hope for resuscitating dreams, for touching frowning faces, healing broken smiles that hang from digging dimples. Love has bonded to my spirit's nucleus like the morrow of Adam mourning for his Eve, and its image has breathed extensions into my soul like respirators. And its grace has placed me on these escalators so that the tears of separation, they, they merely water the vines that are intertwined with dangerous faith that I shall use to move the mountains that are in my valleys, so that his breeze and my redwood trees are in sync with his sun and my roots. They grow in Eden. No more of that John Legend ordinary love. None of that R. Kelly religious type love. This right here, this is an extraordinary relationship that wasn't even built on trust. Simply grace and mercy, undeserving, one-sided, unfair. This is a very merciful, merciful love affair. 
a mimetic romance like the last dance Christ saved for the church, like two spirits dancing in tongues, singing silent praises to ordered steps choreographed by graceful Broadway plays danced away by black swans like Catherine Dunham or, or, or Sabian Glover. This crimson love has dried the thirst from my prideful velvet and kissed my spirit over and over again and again in different dimensions and in different realms like like this loving father kisses his daughter's open wounds this is nothing less than intimate and it makes me feel like i can conquer the world and every storm in it while inhaling whirlwinds of change the lord loves me still as i change and evolve he loves me but like steel loves words unchanged it doesn't bend it's unmovable and like black we all know love don't crack it just revolves around roses and beating hearts where roses and delilahs clash violently daily while, while crossing broken bridges overseas searching for weapons of mass destruction in her and in he that were actually just shards of mirrors pinned to my own insecure sleeves See, love has shown me the perfect reflection of my imperfection and taught me to adore the scars that adorn me so today I, i'm not just in love with the mere concept of love I'm in love with Jesus. There's no script that's ever compared to the great I am, just missing pieces like, like Boaz and Ruthless or Time Without Matter. Today, I, I'm hopeful because I am whole. And I'm whole because I am taken by the presence of love. Thank you. Breathe that in. Thank you, Damar. Thank you for sharing your gift, your talent, and uh, just up, so uplifting. And don't you love Damar, everyone? Don't you want some more of Damar? <laughs> Thank you. Thank Very you. welcome. Very welcome. You speak, the spirit comes through so strong of light. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to share, Damar? Um, I, you know, I'll just say that, um, you know, we've been talking about, you know, conversations with our children and whatnot. And, and, like, and me personally, because it was my biggest struggle, identity, um, when, when I learned who, who God was and I learned how much he loved me, regardless of what I've done, regardless of what the world tells me, I am, regardless of maybe what even my parents may say, right? When I understand who God is and what he's done for me and, and how he loves me, um, and when I understood grace. So I think, I think that I'll, I'll leave you with that with, uh, with parents. Um, I think the greatest tool in your box is just having some grace because love covers a multitude of sins, right? So if we understand that, if we go into these conversations with our children, seeking to understand and not just to be understood, not with our own agenda, I, I think we'll, we'll move uh, mountains with our children. And I think that'll allow them to open up more once we afford them the same grace that God gives you and I. Yeah. So I, I'll leave that with you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I am just so excited for these amazing people in my life that ha have come in and to share them with you. And we got so much more to go. And uh, just thank you. I just, uh, I'm, my heart is full and tears are coming out as I'm hearing your words that uh, I know so many people need to hear. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, Susie Barrows Bell. She is a uh, body talk practitioner, and she's going to be speaking on Dear Younger Self, You Are Divine with her crown, her lovely crown. Thank you so much, and I hope that it's not too distracting with the echo. Um, so I grew up feeling depressed, but I didn't know it. And I didn't know how to open up because my parents who love me didn't know how to open up and talk about it. I just didn't know. And how many of us just didn't know until we knew one day. So this continued and I was pregnant with my second daughter. And I didn't even know that antenatal Depression was a thing, pregnancy while you're, sorry, depression while you are pregnant. So I had this memory and I was really, really 
in the depths of despair. I was laying on the floor in my shower, crying. And the thoughts that went through my head, I have no purpose. What's the point? Nobody loves me. I want to die. Why should I keep going when it's just so hard right now? Even though I had this beautiful little child in my belly, I felt no purpose. But at the same time, I could sense these other little spirits that are with me saying, keep going. We want to come down and be with you. But what I look back and recognize, it's those negative thoughts that were in my head that brought me down the steep spiral of worthlessness and hopelessness. And it's the thoughts that I kept thinking that made a difference. So I wrote myself a letter. I wrote, Dear younger self, your value is not measured by your success, your mistakes, your grades, your struggling relationships, or how many friends you have. It's not measured by how much money you make or your job. You are divine by design with a purpose. You may not see it now, but it is beautiful. You can take this experience and grow and become strengthened. This will be a gift to you. You deserve to be treated with love and respect. You are a gift to everyone you know. You are a queen. You always were and you always will be. Love your higher self. Now, if you are struggling, I would invite you to insert your own name into there. What I have learned in the past eight years is that as a practitioner and a mentor and through all the training that I've learned and implemented is that every experience that we have can be a gift when we allow it to be. When we take ourselves out of the mode of victim, and we figure out what we've learned from the situation, how to become better, then we can actually heal. And when we look deep down inside at our hurt and we face it with courage, we can come out of that stronger and better than we ever knew how. Your biggest mistake that you have made in your life can be your greatest gift by making one simple choice, changing the words that you tell yourself and then changing your actions as a result. Your words that you tell yourself, they create the emotions that you feel. They created that despair that I have felt. They created the despair I felt last week. But now I know that I can shift them around by just choosing different words, even if I don't feel it at that moment. I can still change the words. And that will make a difference. You are a light. At times, your light flickers and goes out, but it's just buried. Dig down deep, journal it out, and the light will shine again. So here are some things that I do to work through the hard, because every stage of life I have been in, there has been hard, and there have been challenges. The first is to become aware, to write down what it is that I've been feeling. That has been so powerful for me. The negative things that come to my head that I'm not worth it, that it's better just not to live, those are lies. They're not truth, and they're not there to serve me. So I tell them to stop now. And instead, I tell myself this. I love myself exactly as I am. My value does not change. I am worthy of love in any emotion I feel. I matter and I am important. And you are important too. Now look to the light no matter how small. It could be a song, a TV show, painting, just getting out in nature. No matter how small that light is, reach for it. And the last thing is when it gets to that point where you just can't do it on your own, reach out. Reach out to that person who will listen, who will love you, and will comfort you. There is somebody. Take the courage that you have in your heart and do it. Thank you so much. 
Susie, beautiful crown that we can all feel like that, as Marlise said, to feel like that, that princess, that prince inside, no matter what anyone else is saying or doing around us. So I, I'm so happy you wore that crown and thank you so much for your message. Thank you so much. All right, we are moving on to our awesome, our next, next awesome speaker, and that is Sarah Clements. And she is a chaplain. She is a pastoral counselor. She's working with uh, addictions. And she gave us that beautiful song earlier and love her hair. So Sarah, come on in. She's gonna be talking about interrupting the depression path. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as you heard, I'm a chaplain and I love it. Um, I work with a lot of youth and um, that go through a lot of struggles. And I really appreciate what was just shared because it just ties right in to what I want to share with you today. Um, I'm also a relationship educator and I guess I just like to do lots of things. And I'm a mom. Oh my gosh, I love that the most, I have to say. Um, so in part of the, the free classes that I teach, I talk about interrupting the depression path. And um, uh, I want to say this is this is not mine. This comes from um, Intuitive Relationships, their growth climate curriculum. They are trying to help people have a climate of growth in their home. And so we, they call it the resistance and depression model because sometimes we respond out of resistance, which isn't necessarily bad. And sometimes we respond in a negative situation with depression. So I want you to picture that you're starting with self-worth and your self-worth is intact. And something happens in your life that you start to kind of wrestle with that. A lot of the time that can be something that is a phrase that discusses your outward ability to do something. Um, are you really sure you can do that? Do you really wanna try that? I don't like trying that. Maybe you've heard a few things like that in your life. And so that can start a self-worth wrestle. If you are not feeling a lot of um, empowerment, if there isn't a lot of um, support in your life, that can continue. That can continue into an instinct wrestle. So you're starting to look at your situation and you're starting to go, can I do this? Can I, in my heart, Am I really good at that? You're not just questioning the outside ability. You're starting to question in your heart. Should I even think this way? Should I even do this? Watch yourself. Watch to see if you've done those things. Interrupt at that point and start considering an affirmation of your self-worth. Or talk to someone and find an affirmation of your self-worth. If not, you might have an experience, you might continue down that path and begin to deny your own instincts. You might look at yourself and you might say to yourself, okay, all right, yeah, I can't do that. And what if you have this little feeling that says, yeah, I can. Well, you're gonna start denying that. If you're going down this path, you're gonna start not listening to your soul, your, your intuitive responses that tell you, I can do that. Maybe you're in an environment that tells you that. Maybe it's not just in your head. That can be really hard. It can be really hard. So I want you to consider if you're in this pattern where you're like, I don't know that I can do this. And there might be someone in your life that has said these things to you, or you might have heard them from someone, especially like if you've heard from a, someone you consider a loved one, I don't know that you really can do that. Or why are you even trying that? You might start thinking, oh, well, maybe they should make that decision for me. Maybe that's, maybe I should have them decide that for me. I'm not really good at that. So I want you to understand what I'm going to be talking about is how we learn how to be helpless. Sometimes we don't even realize we're learning this. Sometimes we actually think we're already helpless. And I want you to be able to understand that you can reconnect with your intuitive responses, with your soul, with your higher power, and be able to understand better why you're wrestling with your self-worth and how you can get out of that. Because once you've learned how to be helpless, that's when you start heading into 
depression. That's when you listen to other people telling you things to do that might actually violate what you feel is right. And that helps you to not value yourself. And we don't want that help. We want to value ourselves. And you are going to feel that depression when you're not valuing yourself. So I want you to take a moment right now. And I want you to think to yourself, I am wonderful. I am beautiful. I am love. At the core, I agree with that. That's who you are. So you're of value to me. You are not alone. I will stand with you. And that's my message. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, we're moving to our next speaker, Eliza Dorsch. And she is a mom. She is a survivor. She's going to be speaking on leaning on God in hard times. Hello, everyone. Um, like Carolyn said, I am Eliza Dosh. I am a suicide attempt survivor, and I am currently a holistic life coach. And my focus is on helping people to develop self-love and self-acceptance um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so today I am going to share a little bit about my story. It's going to be the super short version um, because I'm literally writing a book <laughs> about um, the things I went through and my journey. So you're just going to get a little tiny snippet of it. Um, and I'm so excited to speak with you guys today because this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart and that I've known for a long time that I need to share my story. And so I'm super grateful that I was able to get connected with Carolyn on this platform to do that. <coughs> um, so, um, like I said, today I am, I am a life coach. I'm starting my own business. I am a mother to a beautiful um, eight month old baby boy. Um, I have an amazing husband and um, you know, five or six years ago, I never would have expected to be where I am today. Um, my junior year of high school, um, my parents separated and began the process of getting a divorce. And that sent me spiraling into a really deep, dark depression. Um, it totally, <laughs> totally punched out my self-esteem. I felt completely worthless and that um, I had no purpose. What was the point if my family um, wasn't together and I, I wanted to die. I no longer wanted to, to be part of the world. And I had a lot of miracles and, and things happened in my life that kept me going along the way. And um, then my senior year of high school, I was finishing up um, a production. Um, it was the closing night of the show and I didn't feel like I had a purpose anymore. I felt like the thing that had kept me going was over and that there was no point. Um, and I remember driving home that night in my, in my car and just screaming at God, um, just <laughs> letting everything out that I'd been holding in for the last 18 months. I just screamed at him and I cursed at him and, <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend this, but I gave God an ultimatum. And I told him, you better turn my life around or I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. And when you give God an ultimatum, be ready to move your feet. Be ready for things to change. It's so four days later. Um, well, a couple days later, I discovered a wilderness therapy program. And four days later, I was on my way to Utah to start participating in this program that completely changed my life and helped me begin the journey of, of healing. <coughs> so real quick, um, I'm running out of time here, but I want to just say a few things about leaning on God during those hard times. Um, the first one, tell him exactly how you feel. 
just let it out. Like, I promise he can take it. Like, if you can't talk to anyone else in your life, if you can't tell them exactly how you feel, you can tell God. And he knows he understands. And like, if you need to scream at him because you're mad at him for the situation that you're in, do it. He can take it. It's okay. Like, tell him exactly how you feel. Tell him your deepest, darkest thoughts that you don't think anyone else, like if you tell anyone else, they'll stop loving you. Tell him those because he won't stop loving you. <coughs> His love is unconditional. Um, and the second one is make a conscious choice to, to get better, to change, like whatever it is that you need to do to improve yourself and to allow healing of Christ to enter into your life, do it. Um, and then the last thing I would say is have compassion with yourself. You're human. You make mistakes. That's okay. God understands. He knows you. He loves you. And just open yourself up to, to the love he has for you and allow yourself to feel, feel that love and be patient with yourself because, um, recovery and healing. It's not a one and done event. It's a process. And I'm still working through that process entirely today, but my life is so much better and more beautiful than I could have even imagined. And even in my current struggles, I am so grateful that God saved my life and that I am here today and that I am able to live this beautiful life that I have been so blessed with. Um, and I'm excited to continue to share more with you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Eliza. All right. Uh, we might be making a change here. Wondering, Terry, are you still on there? Do you want to come on now? Terry and Steven, I think they had to hop off. Okay. We, we are here. So. Okay, go ahead, guys. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, my name is Terry King Hunt. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Terry Teaches, and uh, we here are co pastoring a church in Atlanta called Community of Faith Christian Ministries. Uh, one of the things that I just want to quickly share with each and every one of you listening is the power, the healing power of writing prayers and scriptures. I remember that I had been going through a really, really dark moment in my life. And um, I was talking to my husband and he mentioned to me that scriptures were the letters that God had written to us. And I remember thinking to myself, I've been in the church my whole life. I grew up in the church and the Bible never struck me as a letter or a communication to me. And I said to myself, okay, let's see what there is about this. I talked to God and I said, Lord, if you're really talking to me through the scriptures, then I need you to show up and talk to me. And so one of the decisions that I made is I'm going to read the scripture and then I'm going to respond back with my own letter in response to whatever I read. And through that process, I saw that the words that God was speaking to me were for me. And I understood that through reading the scriptures and seeing them as a letter to me and responding to them through my own words and through the, as a letter, I began to understand that there was power and there was healing. And I have developed a process. I've developed some writing strategies. I've developed some things that you can do when you're looking at scripture and writing them down and responding to them that I'm so excited to be able to share with you. And we don't have a whole lot of time here today, but the one thing that I do want to give each and every one of you as your takeaway from me today is to read the scriptures and ask yourself, what is this saying to me? And then respond in writing, respond with a letter, just, hey, thanks for writing me. This is what I heard you saying and watch what will happen when you do that. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce you because I didn't get a chance, Terry and her husband, uh, Stephen um, Hunt, 
right? And he is a pastor and a psychologist. Is that correct? Yes. And they're from Atlanta, Georgia. And they just uh, connected with me yesterday and jumped on this opportunity. You get to hear more from them and their story in October 7th. So take it away, Stephen. Okay, all right. Thank you. As I um, go through um, work life, uh, at church, and uh, as a psychologist, I am confronted with people all the time who are just tired and they're burnt out. Um, people always come to me and say, Doc, I I'm out of gas. I, I, I just don't have what it takes to, to go any further. And what I discover a lot of times with people, people give, we give and we give and we give and we give some more. Um, someone call you up and say, hey, I need you to be a part of this. And we say, yes, and it, it feels good. We feel important. And one day you get up and you're like, oh gosh, I am at the end of my road. I cannot do this anymore. I, I, I am done. And we call that burned out. Hmm. And uh, a burned out happened when we're at our breaking point. But how did we get there? And uh, I like to look at, at human beings uh, this, in the same way that we look at, um, let's say, our cars, our automobile that takes us around. And uh, there is something that we have to do with our cars um, ever so often. We got to service it. We got to make sure that we're taking care of that car or else it's going to stop on the road with us. And it's the same thing with our, ourselves. If we don't take care of us, then of course we are gonna break at some point. And this, we call it self-care. Mm -hmm. Self-care is a very important, especially when we, when we talk about we're in the industry where we are taking care of other people. And to some capacity, every human being is taking care of another person. It's parents, you are taking care of your, your, your children and your spouse. And, 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 and you leave the house and you, you go out and you do a job, you're taking care of somebody else. So our lives are, is, is a life of taking care of others. But the only way we can do that is mm. if we are taking care of us. So if there, if there's no self-care happening, then absolutely nothing else that we do mm. can be done effectively. Mm. And, and one, one of the saddest thing to see is when you look and you see a pastor committed suicide, mm -hmm. because you look at that mess, all the messages that the pastor preach up to that point, and you go, Dude, you were preaching, telling me how to do this and how not to do this, and look what you do. Not only pastors, doctors, the same thing. Um, teachers, the same thing. Um, parents that you respected in the community, they, they do something and you go, how could you? And all of this happen when there is no self-care. And this is why taking care of oneself is important. But the thing about self-care is, and I'm going to say this quickly because um, th there is, we don't have a lot of time to go into all of this, but a lot of times we misunderstand self-care self and it becomes a very complex when it, when it is really very simple. Because while self-care is a technical term, the truth is self-care looks different for every person. Amen. My self-care does not look like your self-care. If I'm an introvert and you're an extrovert, self-care is going to look totally different. Um, so, 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 so when I break self-care down, self-care is taking care of yourself in a way that works for you. Not another transcript that somebody gives you and you go, okay, in order to take care of self, you have to be doing all this. But self-care is taking care of yourself in a way that, do for you, uh, that works for you. A quick example that, 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 I, that I give in my presentations 
um, is this. I don't take showers. Come on. I enjoy my showers. <laughs> There's a difference. A person might go, look at the clock. Okay, they, 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 I got to get to work. I got to do this. Let me go take a quick shower. And life, and, and life just roll in and uh, uh, into one thing to the next, to the, and there is no mindfulness ending to your day. But self-care for me is, okay, I am going to be in the shower. I have 10 minutes, and I'm not going to be thinking about um, the, 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 the person who's sitting in my, in my office. I'm not going to be thinking about the person that I, that I spoke to yesterday. That is my 10 minutes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself that 10 minutes and I'm going to focus on me. So self-care begins with when you're doing whatever you do for yourself, if all you have in your, in your day is 10 minutes to focus on yourself, then focus on yourself in those 10 minutes. Make sure that you are being selfish for your, because self-care is not selfish. Self-care is important. And, 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 that's, and that's what I want to point out right now. One important thing that I want to add into that is when we do self-care, self-care gives awareness. Amen. Because as you're taking care of yourself, then you are realizing what you're not doing and what needs to be done. And the only way to prevent breaking points and burned out is to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we can't wait to hear more from both of you. October 7th, we get to get more in depth. And thank you for saying yes and showing up today. We just love your energy. Thank you both. All right. We are moving on to our next lovely speaker. That is Claire Marie Miller. Come on down, Claire. She is a, a holistic practitioner. And she's going to be speaking on uh, creating a new label self-talk. I think she has another title. Go ahead, Claire, tell us. That's okay. Welcome, everybody. Glad to be with you. This is exciting. I'd like to start by a story and uh, an experience I had uh, several years ago. I had been in uh, a great relationship with an individual and just so happy until one day some things started to happen and the relationship stopped happening many words were said very abusive words at times and the pain started to come as that occurred i started to listen to what that individual was saying and then some individuals around me. And my self-talk became one that was very negative. I started to buy in to what they said. Have you ever come in to someone who was talking to you in a negative way and begin to believe it? I think we've all been there and we've all had that experience. Well, it was very hard. And the words that seemed to resonate with me after all was said and done was, I'm just not enough. I've got to be the ugliest person on this planet. And that talk started in a loop. Have, has talk ever started in a loop for you where you repeat it over and over again to yourself? Well, it started to repeat. And as it repeated, as the self-talk repeated, my actions followed. And my actions became one that were, was negative and hurtful and destructive. Then one day, by the grace of God, and I believe in him totally, a phone call came and asked me, believe it or not, to teach a course for a university in our area on being positive. <laughs> I said yes and hung up the phone and thought, oh, I've got to get my act together. I've got to change this. This is crazy. 
So I started to get my act together. And the first thing I did was to examine what I was saying to myself. What was the talk I was using? And through prayer and through thinking and pondering and writing, I decided I needed a new label, a new thing that I could say to myself that was positive. Well, let's see. I changing the opposite. I am ugly. Hmm. What should I say? I am pretty. Ah, oh, that sounded awful. My mother always said, pretty is as pretty does. That just did not resonate with me at all. Hmm. I am beautiful. Oh, mountains and lakes are beautiful. It just didn't come. And then the revelation came. I am gorgeous. Oh, I like that. That just fit me right down to my toenails. I loved feeling the energy and the vibration of I am gorgeous. Oh, I love that. And I started to say it. And the rule of thumb is when you're changing your positive label, you're saying it 25 times a day. Why? Because it puts it on a subconscious level. And 21 days because it makes it a habit. Then I had to remember to say it. What could I choose? Well, I was traveling a lot in my work at that point in time, so I chose red cars. Every time I said a red car, I would say my label. Oh, red car go by and I go, oh, I am gorgeous, by golly, yes, sir. And things started to change. Well, I was way in to saying my label, kind of came became like Pavlov and his dogs. Every time a red car came, and do you know how many red cars there are here in Utah? Holy mackerel, I think it's a cult. My goodness. And so the label was said often, often. One day, way after 25 days, I was sitting at an intersection. My windows were down. It was a nice cool breeze. And two big trucks came up on each side of me, laden with construction workers all over the back of them as a little red car went across the intersection, automa automaticity hit and I shouted at the top of my voice, woohoo, am I gorgeous? Ha! All of a sudden I had faces peering into my window, looking and trying to, oh, well, what is she saying here? And they spit on thinking I was probably a crazy woman, but it changed and it changed me. And I began to believe in myself and what I could do. And so my friends, my message to you is, look at your self-talk. What are you saying to yourself? And allow God to help you find a label that will change you and change your abilities because that's finding the true power within. God created you to be successful. He created you for this time to be here because you are meant to do great things. Starting with your self-talk, it will change everything for you. I wish the Lord's greatest blessings on you. Thank you. Wow, Claire, thank you. I love your enthusiasm. What a great story and so, so powerful and right on about Changing our self-talk is the first step, watching those thoughts and change it. So everyone, we are all gorgeous, right? <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Lizzie Love. Love the name. Lizzie, come on down. Lizzie is 15, and she just um, connected with me yesterday, and she had such a desire to speak and share her message and reaching out to all the young people listening. So we're so pleased to have Lizzie and she's gonna be speaking on accept, how to accept yourself even with your struggles. Hi everyone, my name is um, Lizzie Love. My real name is Elizabeth, but I do like to go by Lizzie or Ella. And today I'm here to talk about showing and accepting yourself even through your struggles and what i mean by showing yourself is how you express emotions and the struggles that you experience in today's society especially with the youth 
Many people tend to push their feelings down instead of communicating them. A significant social standard that has formed over the years is that we need to look happy and or perfect 100% of the time. What we see in the media is often edited or made to look better than its reality. People online are so quick to call out others for mistakes they make, attacking them. It can really make you feel like you need to hide all these mistakes and imperfections. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. The truth is no one is perfect. No actors, celebrity, social media, or friends are perfect. The truth is they struggle just like us. Those celebrities are professionals at hiding, faking, and putting on a show. Actors, it's in their title. They're good at acting. Does that make them bad people? No. But occasionally we can forget that it's what they're doing. And we feel like we have to be someone better than ourselves to be accepted. Sometimes it still feels like the most comfortable option to push everything down. I've dealt with this a lot. I've dealt with suicidal thoughts at a very young age that I remember clearly. I have a lot of bad memories from some time ago, but I'm a different person than I was then. And after I was able to work through all of those or some of those major trials, I noticed that there were still some problems along my road. I noticed that I wasn't 100% happy. And I was like, what? No, I'm okay now. I want to show people that I'm happy. I want to show people that I'm okay. And so I started to shove everything down inside me, locking away my anxieties. I created this mask that I wore around other people, even my family, to prove to everyone that I'm happy, I'm okay. And it will Overall, I was trying to prove to myself that I was okay as well. But this only made things worse. All of my yucky feelings just grew and grew. I started to realize that I needed to let go. I realized that this was only holding myself back from my connections with others. I wasn't able to try my best because my best was hidden deep inside me. It wasn't easy. It takes a lot of hard work. And in fact, I'm nowhere near letting go of everything I've bottled up over time. But as I begin to set these burdens free, it's like I'm setting myself free. It's a challenging journey, but as Mrs. Watson from Wrinkle in Time says, my child, do not despair. Do you think we would have brought you here if there was no hope? We have asked you to do a difficult thing, but we are confident that you can do it. And that reminds me a lot of God and Jesus Christ how they're here for us, and they know that we can do it, especially with their help. I'm human, and I'm never going to be 100% perfect or struggle-free, and that's okay. There will be difficulties throughout my path of life. That's what makes me who I am. That's what makes you who you are. As I tar start to accept my obstacles and learn to jump over them, I find myself. I'm able to get to know the real me and be in touch with my feelings. I'm able to grow closer to God and Jesus Christ and have a better relationship. To quote Frozen 2, you are the one you've been looking for all of your life. Everyone battles with mental health, even Disney princesses. Your flaws, mistakes, and afflictions are human, but how we deal and accept them makes us who we are. Wow, Lizzie, uh, tears are coming. Uh, powerful uh, message. I loved your quotes and you have a gift here in speaking and sharing a message. And I'm so excited to hear more of your story October 7th when we do this again and, and bring in more. Thank you, Lizzie. Just, uh, and yeah, she just put this together. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next lovely speaker is Patty Hicks Sefter. She is a youth life coach and speaker. She's going to be speaking on live a life, finding joy, one foot in front of the other. Thank you. Move your feet. Years ago, my daughter had a severe health crisis and I was almost crippled with fear. 
for her future after hearing her diagnosis. I remember dropping her off at school after one of her appointments and I had to go and pick up some things. I went to the department store parking lot and sat there in my car and looked at the doors of the entrance and figuratively thought and prayed, I do not have the strength to walk this journey. I cannot make it to those doors. As I cried out to God for strength, I heard just as clear as I say them now, move your feet. I can do that. All of a sudden I had hope restored. As we walk our trail moving our feet, remember the greatest sights are at the heights of the mountains. There's going to be steep inclines. There's going to be rocks to climb over and boulders to jump around. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fall. Did you guys know early on Walt Disney was fired because they said he lacked imagination? Abraham Lincoln started out as a shopkeeper and he had to sell his share of the business because it didn't make any money. Sean White, a two-time Olympic gold medalist in snowboarding, was born with severe heart defects. He had three surgeries when he was a baby to clear up four heart abnormalities. He persevered. They persevered and you can persevere. You are going to fail. It's okay. You are going to fall. It's okay. Move your feet. Last year, my father-in-law passed away and he was a Harley man. In fact, all of the writers called him Dog. That was his nickname. And I just kept having this thought, I am, I've got to learn how to ride. I want to ride for Dog. <laughs> so I was terrified. The more I thought about this goal, the more I became terrified. I had no idea how a motorcycle worked. And even my husband, he couldn't really understand because he grew up on a motorcycle. It was like secondhand nature to him. But I stepped forward. I signed up for the motorcycle riding course. I learned how to work the clutch and the throttle and the brakes with the clutch. I learned all the gears and I continued to learn. I, I remember um, I sat there on my motorcycle when it was my turn to go and tears rolled down my cheeks underneath my full face enclosed helmet. <laughs> I was terrified. But guess what? I didn't quit. I continued to learn, to grow. Trying is what leads to accomplishment. Every single one of you have special gifts. Light within you. You have things that you desire to accomplish, things that you want to do, ambitions. Don't be afraid to move your feet. Henry B. Eyring's mother used to tell him, if you're on the right path, it will always be uphill. You have marvelous opportunities ahead and the greatest paths lead to the most beautiful views. You can look back on the trail that you walked and think, wow, that's really cool. Look what I accomplished. So don't let your fall cripple your tomorrow. Move your feet. Thank you so much, Patty. Move your feet one step in front of the other. Keep going. It gets brighter. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Laura Davis. She is a mom and a survivor, and she's gonna be speaking on choosing to be me. One of my favorite messages, being free to be myself. And come on down, Laura. Thank you. I am Laura, a wife, a mother to four boys, a sister, a friend, and a teacher. I love to learn. My main interests lately have been emotional health and the mind and body spirit connection. Um, I also love to write. It's something I used when I was younger to help organize my thoughts. And although I didn't really share those, um, I wrote a poem today that I will be sharing later. I was asked to share my story. Growing up, 
I always felt disconnected from others and lonely. I felt like I didn't really fit in. And my body even created these debilitating headaches to keep me home, to keep me from connection as a way to protect my heart. I was first diagnosed with depression as a teen and this diagnosis came as a shock. I experienced more anger. I did not spend time crying or just feeling sad all the time. I felt anger and more of not being able to speak my thoughts or have people to listen to those thoughts. Um, as I continued through college, I still felt very lonely and I tried to distance myself because I was told to live in this world and not of the world. I shut myself away. I kept my heart closed because I learned that an open heart meant pain. I became a mom at a really young age and as the exhaustion of a new motherhood came over, I felt so angry, not at my child, just that I wasn't getting enough sleep. I didn't have connections to reach out to, and that anger just continued. I had a friend reach out to me recently who had been part of my life a while ago, and as we reconnected, uh, I asked him about his struggles with depression. I knew that he had struggled, and I wanted to know how he was truly doing. And he shared with me, and he was very candid in what he shared, and for the first time, he asked me if I struggled with depression or if I struggled with suicide. And I was able to open up to him in a way I hadn't opened up even to myself, that I did struggle and that I did have thoughts of wanting to be done on this earth. And I learned through that experience that there is, there's power in connection and that healing comes when you share with others and when you connect with others. Um, he later made the choice to end his life and that brought up so many feelings of guilt to, for me and sadness and my thoughts continued to spiral down and wanting to leave. I didn't see a point in a life that had pain and I had experienced so much pain. I had seen pain in others and I couldn't understand why you would want to continue on. I started working with someone to work on my connection with others. I recognized at that point that I wanted to connect with others, but I couldn't. And as he taught me, the first thing to do was to tell the truth to yourself. And as I look myself in the mirror, to tell the truth that I do experience these thoughts um, and that that's okay. And I also found that through experience of losing a loved woman that I found fear, fear that I would make that choice. And then all the beliefs that I had, would other people assume that I was selfish? And I had to work through those beliefs and fears. In that moment, I was able to choose. I decided that I wanted to be fully present. I no longer wanted to just survive day to day. I wanted to thrive. I wanted to find joy. And I wanted to share with others what I have learned. I, I learned many, many things from these experiences. But what I wanted to share mainly today is that it's connection. Connection, the disconnection is what brings on those feelings of loneliness and disconnection and wanting to leave. That is the connection that I am seeking and that connecting with others is what brings the healing. And now I can look at notice how I'm feeling and noticing myself pulling away, notice, and I can take the steps to bring that around and make that shift in my thinking and to connect with others. Here's my poem. Choosing in this moment to breathe, tears falling like rain, heaviness, darkness all around, just breathe, disconnected, darkness, a heart full of pain, pulling away, wanting to leave, tears falling like rain, breathing, breathing, the light appears so far away, me feeling so small, do I matter, does any of it really matter, just breathe, Seed of love growing, 
moving through me as I breathe, choosing to breathe, choosing to be. That's enough. Just breathe. The breath is what anchors me to the present. As I breathe, I can notice what I feel, see, hear, and I'm experiencing. I can notice my thoughts. I can then investigate my thoughts and decide if they are true or not. I can choose to connect with others. I can choose what makes me feel connected. I can choose to feel my emotions as they come. I can choose to love. Love is always the answer. I have a vision of gathering people to connect, to create a space for sharing for those who've been through an experience of depression or suicide or losing another one. And that is my vision that I hold and that I want to invite people to connect. Thank you so much, Laura. I, I just know so many people are resonating with your story and your poem was just epitomizing that. But that message is so powerful about breathing. I, I work with uh, a lot of people with uh, anxiety and depression and I teach them many tools with the mindset and releasing their emotions. And I ask them, what was the most helpful thing that I did? And they, many of them will say the same thing. It was deep breathing. Deep breathing puts us in the moment. It helps us let go. We get oxygen to our brain to uh, clear out uh, the negative thoughts and, um, and such a powerful tool if just deep breathing. We need to do that more. And your poem, um, you know, I loved how you, you, you shared that. And I can't wait to hear more of your story and that people can reach out to you. Um, she's a listening ear. She has a loving heart. And thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next guest is a surprise guest. Uh, I didn't know she was going to be on today. Uh, actually, the spirit just told me this person needs to, to, to share. And it happens to be my daughter, Holly. And she's going to be talking about nine reasons to live. Oh, let's see. Get me on the big screen. How do we get me on the big screen, Linus? Is, is she sitting right next to you? Yes. Can you just move her over to the, to the uh, camera a little bit more? Yes, I just lost the camera. Oh, there it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just have her move over into the um, frame of the camera a little bit more. Okay, there you go. Hi, I'm Holly McGraw and I'm 12 years old and today I'm going to be sharing nine reasons to live. So the first one is you are important. We all are important and have significant value on this earth and are here for a reason. And I truly believe that and I, 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 that's that's what I believe and think and number two is you are strong you have the power to um, be happy and love life you've got the muscles and four is you are worthwhile you are worth being here and worth what you have and the people around you and number five is you are not alone and I know I felt like I was alone before, but I know that I always have my family by my side and friends and also Heavenly Father. And you just have to remember that there are always people there looking out for you, even if it doesn't feel like it. Number six is life gets better and you have to let it get better and know and look forward to life getting better and move on from all your depression and let life get better. And seven is this pain is only temporary. And I know I felt like I, I was just sad and I felt like I was gonna feel like that forever. But 
then I know there's always something to look forward to and always something that's going to get better. And eight is you will recover and life will get better. And number nine, this isn't really a reason to live, but it is a key step to living. It is never give up. And if you give up, then you won't have any of, you won't be able to be happy. You just have to keep fighting to be happy and love life. And I know that I used to feel like I had no purpose and that there was nothing for me, even though I knew there was, it just felt like there wasn't anything. And if I had given up, I wouldn't have found friends that cared about me and gotten close to my family and found things that made me happy. So just remember to never give up and that's all. Bye. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> just her bright smile cheers people up so I wanted everyone to see her. Um, so our next person is and we have let's see two more people and that is Marlise Hyde she is a nurse and she uh, has a, an amazing clinic in, uh, in Orangevale uh, erasing pain and she is so knowledgeable you can ask her a question on anything she has an answer I am so impressed with her and well, so not anything <laughs> She's talking on flipping the switch to turn off anxiety. We all need this. Thank you, Marlise. Okay, let us you have to let me share my screen because I'm a teacher and I use all kinds of media. And so I, I use PowerPoint slides for the visual learners and all the other things. So I'm trying to share my screen. And Linus, I can't share my screen. It's disabled. <laughs> Please enable it. Uh, it's disabled. There we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Hopefully. All right, so I'm gonna talk really fast because there's a lot of this and I'm just gonna skim the surface and I'll let you know that what I was gonna say completely changed when I woke up with the theme of Frozen 2 in my head this morning. So Lizzie, we are on the same wavelength. <laughs> um, I, is everybody seeing my screen, I hope? Um, so I don't see it on Facebook, anyway. Uh, hopefully at least so I'm talking about flipping the switch on anxiety But depression and anxiety are two sides of the same coin so it can do either way and they're both about being out of balance So the first thing I want to say is water has memory if you can see this screen It comes from Olaf and frozen 2 is just the best introduction to energy healing 101 that everybody didn't know about it Water is also a computer and it has both memory and intelligence So for the teenage group think of your body like a computer our body is mostly water. Your brain is 83%, your heart is 75%, so if you're dehydrated, that's the first thing. But more than that, because water is memory and water is a computer, you can program it. And you program your body to do the things that you want it to do and to vibrate in the comfortable place for it. And depression is vibrating too low and anxiety is vibrating too high. So I'm gonna talk about a lot about how to program your physical body to help with controlling all of these emotions. And here's a little screen about brain waves, and you can see that you know your body does different things and there's different names for these brain waves, but they're all vibrating at different speeds. And so this is really important. So what we want to focus on is the that middle one, alpha waves, is where we're kind of awake and relaxed and what I call Zen mode. Okay. And the best and the fastest and the easiest way and my favorite way to program your body and change your vibration is through music. So uh, um, I got a couple of ways that I do that. The worst thing you want to do when you're waking up in the morning is wake up to beep, 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 beep. So first thing you do <laughs> to quit being angry in the morning at your alarm clock is change your alarm clock. And I'm going to play you just a snippet. Uh, this is what I wake up to every morning to program my day to start right. Each new day waits before me like an empty page that I may write upon. What will my story be? I know it's up to me. So I begin. 
And that changed so much in my life, just waking up to that instead of an annoying alarm clock every morning, waking up with hope and the right vibration and a goal for the day. Um, you can start with something you can control. Start with making your bed and then you've accomplished your first task of the day and you're well on your way to going ahead. Now, when things happen and unexpected things happen and, um, you know, there was a time in my life oh, about 10 years ago where four of the five pieces, major pieces of my life fell apart all within a few days of each other. Uh, my fiance married somebody else and I lost my job and I lost my home and <laughs> my whole life was in a shambles and everybody was like, why are you not suicidal? And, you know, I knew who I was and I knew it would get better, but it was hard. And so I learned a lot of tools. And when I went through that program, one of the tools that I came up with for myself was making playlists of music based on the emotions I was feeling that I wanted to change. And this is where I really learned about changing frequencies. Um, and so I wanted to play you one more snippet. So when I'm feeling sad or depressed, because that's kind of what we're focusing on today, and even I was a little suicidal for a time, just like it was not worth it, but but it was, and things got better. Um, so I used, you know, my niece's song that, you know, the one they just made is now on this playlist as well. But I'm trying to bring a slower vibration higher. But, uh, you know, going along with this Frozen 2 theme, here we go. I don't know anymore what is true. I can't find my direction. I'm all alone. The only star that guided me was you. How to rise from the floor when it's not you I'm rising for. Just do the next right thing. And can you feel how it starts slow and builds up and it slowly raises the slow vibration? And then at the end of the day, end your day with gratitude and a goal. So say thank you to God for all the good things that happened today and make one small goal for something you want to accomplish the next day that gives you something to look forward to and to plan for and to dream about. And dreams are how we create our life and our future and program our frequencies for the future. Okay. Let's get um, into what I was originally going to talk a little bit more about is our physical bodies. So our bodies, when they're stressed, there's what we call the fight or flight system. And then we also have another nervous system on our body that's the counteracting opposite of that where we eat and sleep and digest. And your body literally can only be in one system at a time. So there's a switch that you have to flip between these two. Okay. And it's what we call is the vagus nerve is the physical switch in our bodies that that does this for us. So the vagus nerve connects all the body parts together. It branches out to everything. And it's the control center for the Zen system. It controls inflammation, so it also controls pain, uh, manages and processes our emotions and the gut instinct. So a lot of people have talked about a lot of tools, and I've got a list of 30 of them that I'm going to present on October 7th. Um, music is the first one. Um, physically, you can massage on the side of your neck where that vagus nerve is, or the top part of the arch of the foot, where the other part of the vagus nerve comes to the surface there. And massaging in both of those places will literally flip the switch, switch out of stress and start your body vibration slowing down. Okay, uh, the speaker before me talked a lot about breathing. So there's a slide about breathing. Laughter flips the vagus nerve and brings your body out of stress and speeds it up. Um, jumping on a mini trampoline does the same thing. <laughs> That's why you love jumping on a trampoline or even on the bed as a kid when you're anxious. Doing this jumping motion triggers your vagus nerve and slows your body down. Um, and after three minutes on a trampoline, your energy index doubles and now you're ready with energy to go forward into what you're trying to do. Whoops. Um, and then the other thing you can do is watch a candle because fire light flickers at a frequency to help calm your body down. So I know that was very quick and a very brief overview, and there's so much more to come, but uh, that's what I'm doing there. Okay. Thank you, Marlise. I love learning about the vagus nerve and uh, how we can quickly do things to help ourselves get out of that um, fight or flight. 
And uh, yeah, we need more of Marlise and her tips. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker, our last speaker of the day. And that is Sherilyn Olson Colby. She is an energy practitioner and she's going to be teaching keys for parents to empower their children. I think that the screen is still sharing. Is that correct or do I have it wrong? From there you go. There you go. Okay. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you, Linus, and everyone. These presentations have been awesome. I just want to thank you all. So there's a great spiritual man who lived a few decades ago, Huey Brown, and he was once asked, why was Abraham's test in the Bible so hard? And Hugh responded by saying, because Abraham had to learn about Abraham. And in our life, we are tested. We are actually at war, we could say. And there's been a war that has been going on for many years and that happened a long time ago, but continues every time there is conflict and war. And the truth is that we are told deceptions and half-truths and lies by, I would say, the dark side. You can, you can say Satan, Lucifer, the devil, however you want to imagine it. For me, I, I have that paradigm of, of God and Satan, this dark side. You can plug in whatever words work for you. But one of the things that we are told, we, we have all these thoughts we've been, that, that we're told that you know, oh, my kids won't listen to me if I say that, or no one cares, or why even try? And we've been taught a lot about our thoughts today. But I want to let you know that there are actually some very powerful lies that we are told about ourselves and our identity and our abilities. And I'll talk a lot more about this on October 7th, or totally different, but it's all about helping empower parents to be able to help their youth who are at risk, who are challenged, who are in the midst of struggles in the middle of this war. And a big part of it is, is their identity of who they are. So one of the things I want to say is that, so we've got this power of light and this power of darkness. And light is actually a weapon. It is a weapon. Light is a weapon for good. And who is the author of darkness? Satan or Lucifer or the adversary or the devil, whatever you want to call him. And as the author of darkness, he seeks to confuse us. He seeks to lie to us. He seeks to tell us half truths. And so when we have these thoughts that come into our minds that feel confusing, that make us doubt who we are, that make us doubt our purpose or make us doubt our children's abilities or our abilities, you can be sure that is not of light. And there might be pieces of truth. He's so good at, at twisting truth and giving us pieces of truth. So what is it that we need to do so that we can be clear about truth and be clear about who we are? Okay, I want to share with you just a couple of things. And there's so many things I want to share. I'm, I'm debating about which ones. But when we notice that those thoughts come up, we always have a choice. And I love how Stephen Covey puts it, that in between that place of stimulus, I, the camera's not showing, in between the stimulus and response, in there is this space for us. And that is our choice. And it is one of our greatest powers, our ability to choose. Okay, so when those lies come into our minds, that we need to be sure and remind ourselves, who am I and who is my child? And when we're interacting with our children, when, you know, we might be in a situation that's triggering just the other day, let me share with you super fast. I was hopping in the car to take my kids somewhere and two of my children, they started to do that thing. That's my spot. No, you can't have it. I want to sit there. And before you knew it, the whole car was in an uproar about these two kids and where they were going to sit. Now, maybe you can relate, but when things are really stressful, things can spiral down very quickly. And one of the ways we can flip the switch on that and spiral up is to do a reset inside and first get centered on who am I? What is my purpose right here? And it might be a split second. So what I'm going to invite you to do as a little homework assignment or a coaching request is later write down what are those reset 
phrases of purpose for you. And it might be as simple as saying, as an inspired parent, how do I handle this situation? As a woman of purpose, how do I want to respond to my child? And I'll let you figure that out for yourself later. Now, when we view our kids and see them through their highest vision, and we see this isn't just, this isn't a five-year-old that is fighting over where to sit. This is a young man who has been saved to come at a very, at a time that is intense in the world, and he is a powerful purpose. And, and think about all the things that you know about your child or, you know, your child, your spouse, whoever it might be you're interacting with, a coworker, a friend, another, a loved one. And look at them through your, that eye of who they really are. And it will reset you so that you can interact in that situation from a place of calm, a place of empowerment, a place of inspiration as a vessel for good for them. And so just remind yourself, and you can even pray in that moment, God, please teach me or remind me who my child is, that I might be filled with your love in my interaction with that child right now. And do a little reset, okay? And when we reset our identity to who we really are, and we reset our per perspective of who our child or that other person really is, then we can, then we influence them with our thoughts, with our words, with our energy, with our emotions from a place of in, immense intention. And earlier, one of our speakers shared, um, and I can't remember if this was just sharing earlier in the, in the speaker session or with everyone, that she would, I think it was, I believe it was Sarah, that she will, if, if she doesn't have permission from a child to hug them, she will just do a little poke. And that the intention is, I'm sending you love. I'm giving you love. And our physical touch has so much power. Our words have so much power. Our emotions are laced with power. And we can make those like double whammies for good by, by sending powerful emotion, powerful thoughts, and anchor in that touch. Here's, here's who you are. And I want to remind you, you know, so you're hugging them in this hug is really the meaning of you are a person of purpose. I know you have an incredible mission on this earth and so forth. And, and we can anchor that in. Um, so one more tool I want to share with you that's real quick. Some of you may be familiar with the, the Hawaiian ritual of Ho'oponopono. You can look it up later. Don't worry how you spell it. Google will, will help you. Um, but the concept is that you can talk to somebody else's spirit, okay? And there's some steps you can go through. Those are awesome. Definitely check it out. But you can talk to someone. And if you're having a hard time with someone, you've, you've had a fight, or there are some, you know, feelings that have been stuffed down, or, you're, you know, things didn't go well, you didn't know how to express yourself, articulate yourself well, you can do a redo by talking to somebody's spirit later. You can be driving in the car, it can be before you go to bed or when you wake up. And this is very powerful for parents with a child that is struggling because we might not always have the words, we might not always know the tools, and that, but we can trust they will come forward, they will be manifest to you or your child or another empowered person. But one thing we can always do is remind them who they are. And we can talk to their spirit and just say, hey, loved one, insert the right word for you, the name. I just want you to know I love you and that you are powerful. And I know that things are really hard right now. You could talk about what's going on with school or work or, you know, whatever is the, the current piece of drama or challenge. And just talk to them from your heartfelt self and let them know that you love them, that you know who they really are. It could be 30 seconds, it could be 10 seconds, you could talk to them, their spirit, for a couple of minutes. So you're not physically, physically talking to them, you're not calling them, they don't know this is happening, but this is one of your power tools that I want to introduce to your tool belt that can change lives. Now, there's a, a story that one of my mentors shared. One of his clients was a chiropractor in a large city and he was going through a divorce and it was nasty. And every time they got together for mediation, the, the soon-to-be ex-wife was terrible. They couldn't get anything done. So 
So my mentor taught him this tool and he, he actually did the four steps that are in Ho'oponopono. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And he talked to his spirit or talked to her spirit and he did it every single day for 30 days. Now he wasn't sure this would work, but things were so bad. He was willing to try. And after the 30 days, all the attorneys met, um, he and his wife met to, to mediate again. And she was a different person. And, um, and they walked out of the meeting afterwards and his attorney turned to him and said, what in the world did you do? And he said, oh, you'll never believe me if I told you. He's like, no, you have to tell me. And he told him this thing and he's like, you're right. I, I didn't believe you. And this is just another piece of evidence that it works. And your brain needs evidence. Your child's brain needs evidence. So start tracking evidence in your life. Now I could go on, but I think that's sufficient for today. I just want you to know that you are a powerful influencer, that you have gifts and abilities that are yet untapped. You have an inner reservoir. You need to know who is Abraham? Who are you? as Patty, who are you as Carolyn, as Linus, as you know, put in your name and your child's name and find out what is the message for you in the challenge? What is the tool that God wants to give you? He wants to answer you. He wants you to show up in your true identity and combat the deceptions and lies and the darkness and use powers and principles of truth and of light to combat that darkness. So thank you. Thank you, Sherilyn. Thank you so much. What a powerful message and a tool for our tool belt in helping our children remember who they are, who they really are, and resetting. And I just wanted to say, you know, a special thank you to you, uh, Sherilyn. You were an angel that came in to help me put a special, uh, extra special touch on this event in what you uh, coached me with and uh, prayed with me. And I thank you so much for um, being here. And we need more of you. <laughs> All right, so we are wrapping up uh, this powerhouse. Um, just so touching to my heart, every message, every person that has, has spoken, um, so valuable. And I just hope this gets around the world to all those who need it. Please share us out. We're going to have the recording in, in this Facebook group and it can be shared and send everyone here and get everyone excited for October 7th, where we're going to go into more with more speakers and more uh, exciting things to share with you. And uh, I want to thank you, Linus. She's been running the technical part. She is the founder of the Hope and Wellness events. And uh, she's doing amazing work. And uh, we thank her for all her time and effort. And I just want to leave you with this one phrase. And I believe I'm paraphrasing from um, Gordon B. Hinckley, uh, where he said, hold on, don't give up, keep going. Everything will be all right in the end. There is always hope, one step at a time, happiness just ahead. So keep breathing, go to gratitude, say, say that statement of who you really are, change the words that you're telling yourself, practice gratitude, listen to your soul, remember you are gorgeous, no matter what, you are gorgeous, and tell the truth about yourself and reset go in that reset button when you don't know what to do there's always prayer and thank you again for tuning in and listening and can't wait to connect with all of you again october 7th and we'll see you then bye everybody